Anyway, I'm just going to quickly, you know, we'll, we'll move through the images uh, slightly fast, if that's OK. I mean, um, actually, the one, you know, just one funny joke. The worst kind I've seen of this was when we still had slides. And I invited Stan Allen to lecture to our, in Argentina. And I hope, you know, to make everything right. And we had two projectors with slides. And one of them didn't work. So he had to go through only one, meaning we only saw half the images of all the projects you know, he intended to show, and I'm sure he was rather picky in choosing all the images, as the way we all are. And so he had to lecture, you know, in two halves, let's say. And he actually, he managed quite well. But he's the dean of Princeton, and, you know, I'm not, like, that <laughs> good at that. Um, so anyway, um, what I mean by these, you know, two things and the impacts of, you know, in an architectural or the kind of consequence of that means that there's two things that we are most interested in. One is you know, looking at architecture as body and looking at body as a whole. Meaning every time we look at and we deal with an architectural project, we conceive it as a whole. And, and, you know, and sometimes that has consequences which are, of course, you know, material, but uh, sometimes have you know, positive and negative consequences. And of course, like anything you do, you have to sort of deal with it. And, so this is an important aspect. It uh, doesn't mean that you know, we operate in a kind of uh, artistic or you know, sculptural way. Sometimes we tend to do that. Uh, but it means that we're always like, looking at uh, uh, architectural projects as bodies and in a more holistic way, meaning you know, we try to define a sort of matrix as, uh, as John was describing, uh, or a diagram or an underlying principle that is actually going to tend to control the whole project. And that normally takes place through a kind of marriage between geometry and material. Uh, material through constraints, material not so much through interested in real materials, but through kind of interested in materialities, meaning the actual effects of material on a kind of given set of conditions or bodies. Uh, that's one aspect to it. Now, the way we look at the whole and not understand it, let's say, outside of architecture is by means of articulation. And the way we articulate that is mainly through holes, meaning you know, through a kind of openings, aperture, um, creasing, seams, all the kind of conditions that can allow to actually subdivision a hole in a way that it actually doesn't become a sum of its parts. Clearly, there's a, re and a different array of, strat of strategies by which we work. But that kind of tension between the sort of you know, holistic understanding of a project and between small operations, uh, you know, the most simple description of which could be the definition of an opening, the definition of a window, the definition of long conditions of fenestration, the deepening of fenestration throughout the project so it actually could become a structure or could become an array of different building systems is definitely what I, uh, what I like to talk to, although I'm already doing it. Um, and then, from there goes through you know, the kind of inherent tension between uh, what Tony Crack, who is actually one of my favorite sculptures, defines you know, uh, as sort of working inside and outside material, meaning the necessity for an architect to actually engage material, but also the necessity to work outside material. You know, there's nothing material about construction codes. There's nothing material about clients. There's nothing material or even less about their demands or their change of mind. And there's nothing material about the city as it comes to you know, all the prejudices towards architecture. And one of our commitments within our interest, within our vision, is to make that always adjustable to practice. Meaning, you know, if it doesn't work too many times, we have to actually be able to move beyond past that. And so this idea of materiality, it's something that you know, hopefully defines both, you know, defines the possibilities of working within a, you know, a given medium, within a particular material. Uh, mostly, we're interested in uh, the sort of plasti, uh, the plastibility of the material. I think I'm just made up a word. Uh, the sort of elasticity of material, uh, which is normally associated with plastics. Not so much plastic as a material, but as a kind of, a, um, as, a, as a concept, let's say, you know, where it's less of a material, but it's rather a kind of idea of movement, the idea of transformation embedded on a given substance, let's say. So because of that possibility, issues of molding, um, uh, casting, and all sorts of conditions by which a material is actually subjected to some force and pressure is definitely within our, um, 
intentions and our architectural lexicon. Uh, most of the work, either it is built or unbuilt, deals with that. And, and I think that sort of tension and that change of scale between maybe small projects uh, towards you know, probably medium, not so much large scale buildings, it's something that we are, we are sort of like um, interested in and as it actually produces a contradiction or holes you know, in, in our own practice, uh, hopefully productive holes or not holes that uh, we are not able to um, deal with as we go along. I said most of the stuff, so uh, anyway, so this is that image. And by, by holes, I just mean you know, spaces that they don't necessarily have to be you know, punches in a wall, that's the kind of you know, most simple definition. They could be cavities, they could be fenestration, they could be you know, air that comes to inhabit this holistic organizations, um, you know, which I'm interested in. So don't be um, disguised. You know, this is obviously 144 block composition, yet it's still a hole in our view. It was designed as a hole. Then it actually you know, it's broken down into pieces. Uh, it acquires porosity. It acquires the capacity to you know, uh, relate to landscape. And it's made out of concrete in this other the possibility, of course, of openings and so on to produce a kind of interactive sculpture. Um, these are projects that I'm not going to talk extensively. I showed them you know, when I was here last time. So uh, just for those of you who happen to see this twice, I'm moving into you know, other terrain. Um, you know, though of course, they have to do with fenestration. They have to do with structuration of how you actually put pieces together, uh, in this case, made out of plastic or fiberglass. And, you know, our interest in, in tectonics that actually, you know, move beyond the kind of, uh, you know, the sort of normal idea of like, you know, huge blocks or pre, you know, predefined pieces. Um, this is the element which uh, it was an uh, installation for SciArc um, in 2005. And so in this case, you know, how to make holes which are actually not so much uh, independent from the overall organization of, uh, you know, of a piece, but rather actually um, somewhat subordinated to the structure of the hole, either geometrically, tectonically, and by definition of holes, then you could define either smaller understandings of depth, texture, and of course, relief. And of course, all these associated with program, this is just a prototype, so it was not meant to have a function, uh, but the idea was to actually, you know, uh, produce operations or you know produce conditions that will normally you know boom in between the tension between having a program let's say this is um, you know potential storage area for you know students to you know to to put stuff this is in relation to a uh, a previous piece we have done at Sire. Um, of course in the condition of how to even begin to partition a hole how to look at you know partition a surface in ways that you know it will allow to have a certain cohesion and it will allow also uh, a certain density of uh, partition. So issues of scale come to, you know, come to mind when looking at the hole and looking at you know, uh, subdividing it into pieces which are not just uh, reducible to parts. Um, this is the aspect of plasticity that I was talking about. These are, of course, in the context of galleries, so the performance of these pieces is they're actually soft compared to buildings. But they usually, the way we look at these prototypes, the way we look at sculpture, the way we look at um, installation is as means of prototyping materials, prototyping ideas, and mostly like prototyping sensations, prototyping the effects that these pieces, you know, could produce um, in, you know, probably in a much more contained milieu as the one of the, of the gallery. Uh, these are all fiberglass pieces made in collaboration with experts that deal with the material. And our idea, hopefully, is to move beyond this uh, into, you know, the context of building. This not always happens but the latent potential is there. Uh, now, in doing all sorts of things, of course, we are uh, a young firm, a young practice, and hopefully with intentions that move beyond just trying to practice and, and trying also to locate uh, a kind of discourse and a discussion in our own uh, context. So by doing all these things, we realized that there was something going on, not only in our own work, but also in the work of many of our colleagues that dealt with issues of, you know, that one could probably say quickly as material, let's say. Now, material was not the only question, but it was more materiality, it was the effects of material. And, and we didn't really want to make a huge deal about the material itself, yet the whole thing could actually be um, surrounded by it. So 
The main condition of this show, uh, the main idea of this show, which uh, opened last September in uh, Artispace in New York. Artispace is actually an independent gallery which is famous for having showed artists and architects at the kind of early stage of their career. It's in Soho and um, and we have done the pre, you know, we have done Univadis there, and we were asked to potentially put together a show. And we thought about immediately about trying to locate something that a would move away from this sort of, uh, for me, kind of futile discussion between the sort of digital and the material, into you know what we call the kind of matters of sensation. Let's say the possibility of that the material will just have other ambitions rather than just being you know material being tectonic, being physical, and beyond that, of course. And so sensation was, of course, associated with the work of Francis Bacon and, and the work of, you know, uh, especially, you know, through the sort of, you know, uh, book of Bacon, the logic of sensation, in trying to, you know, this position a term that was not necessarily, of course, it was away from phenomenology still, but it was definitely moving beyond the kind of, you know, cut and dry capacities of the material and describing the descript, you know, describing process or trying to legitimize projects through process that we have seen before, or especially, you know, during the last decade. So the idea was to position a set of works uh, that sort of belong together, that, you know, belong in the gallery, that were prototype oriented, that mean they were not really um, projects of architecture, they were, they were asked to actually be prototypes. So we asked uh, 13 practices to come up with these projects and this project had to have a size and, and they had to definitely, um, as a kind of brief, engage the body and be able to uh, produce sensations one to one, meaning they were not conventional models but they were actually pieces that could be, you know, somewhere in between. They were rather useless or ambiguous at that level because they weren't really either building components nor, um, you know, conventional architectural models. So these are just images that we uh, use in our own um, description and kind of position of this work. This is actually George Harrell. It's uh, a photographer, a very well-known photographer in Hollywood that invented uh, special effects by trying to depict conditions. Um, this is Jennifer Crawford and this is Johnny Westmuller doing Tarzan. Trying to depict conditions through the material, meaning the surface of, this, uh, of these characters and, and produce pictures that were definitely beyond the kind of uh, the sort of black and white picture that was you know done until that time. Uh, more interestingly, he actually used you know linoleum, this sort of oily substance, to paint the bodies of this person to transmit a kind of you know a particular effect. You know, in this case, the kind of fear condition in the body of Sean, you know of uh, of Crawford, and especially also with the kind of effects of light. So. These issues, uh, or the kind of relaxation in this, uh, in this other picture of, you know, of uh, who used to play Tarzan at that time. Uh, so these conditions were definitely interesting, meaning conditions that are actually emerging from the material, they're actually physical, and they are def you know, definitely associated with it, uh, that we could potentially see on, on, on other work. Uh, in fact, uh, Harrell was actually called the Rembrandt of the photography because of the use of glazing, or the sort of similar use of uh, oily substance that will actually parallel the sort of glazing and the use of light that will highlight certain you know parts of the condition, and then of course there was the question of you know finishes as a very uh, simple condition but something that begins to appear as you know as an important aspect that we actually were seeing in, in other work. This is the work of uh, Richard Deacon, sort of food, food inspired sculpture, looking at anisotropic conditions within uh, within a sculpture, meaning that the finish is not something that one uh, you know, defines a priori, but it actually takes place in the work and implies a certain dynamics as you actually paint. So in this particular case, this is actually called a scrambled eggs. Uh, probably not much of a science to make, but there's actually a lot of uh, uh, interesting ideas in terms of how this thing is done. So uh, I'm just going to run through a few images of the show. The, our interest in the show was to definitely create uh, created as a kind of ecology, as what we call a kind of ecology of sensation, meaning you will put together all these pieces and hopefully create a kind of uh, a sort of affective ecosystem where things were actually um, next to each other and, and the gallery work as a kind of, uh, almost as a kind of jungle where you have to see things uh, both, you know, as a sort of general but, you know, more importantly at, at close range. Um, so the idea of the conditions of material, the amount of material, the amount of techniques. Of course, all these pieces were done in one or other way digitally, 
but that was actually out of the equation in terms of like what the, they were meant to do. Uh, was an important aspect to it. And, but another aspect was the, you know, the potential duplicity of material, you know, things that look plastic that were actually not plastic or made, they were mostly synthetic and things that were synthetic that actually looked like, you know, or things that looked like metal and they were plastic and things that were actually metallic and, you know, and, and actually looked like plastic. Um, so these sort of encounters of pieces um, actually, well, I'm not going to go through the entire list, but you, uh, there were people like Hernán Díaz Alonso or Mark Gage or David Ehrman and Clover Lee and Heather Roberts on the background. This is actually an interesting case where what you're looking on the back, you know, it's definitely both are actually made through prototyping conditions. The back part is actually aluminum and yet looks like plastic. This piece is actually made out of plastic and it, you know, it definitely is shine and it's made to look like aluminum. So that condition of, you know, duplicity of materiality was definitely important. And putting things in, you know, because of familiarity but also because of contrast was also important. Also the conditions of, you know, lighting, illumination, um, you know, fenestration through all these, you know, pieces was an important aspect. This is Kiwi Sotama who uh, used to teach here and now we have the luck to have him in LA. Uh, this is Jason Payne uh, through a, you know, totally different medium uh, producing this sort of hairy condition that has, you know, sort of duality of color. <laughs> Uh, Michael Meredith, you know, by which looking at close up, you know, you have the sensation of almost being underwater. And, um, you know, these are all close up images. This is Roy Klein, uh, with kind of a huge meal, and uh, utilizing and, and looking at you know, the possibilities of geometry through symmetry and the amount of effects that begin to, uh, you know, emerge from that. Um, so, there's a catalog that is actually forthcoming and contains chefs. Uh, small essay in that as well. So anyway, this is something of a sort of preamble. It's actually part of what we do in terms of, you know, kind of engendering and, and, and also inducing more discussion, you know, throughout our colleagues and in terms of the way ourselves, actually, we conceive our practice in terms of understanding other practices. Um, I'm going to run through a few other projects uh, that actually kind of, you know, move up in a scale. Uh, this is, you know, the projects deal somewhat, real, you know, they relate to conditions of material, yet there are, you know, a few of them are actually not built, and in some cases they weren't even meant to be built. Um, this is a project that is directly related to the Unibodies, the piece that you saw before, and it has to do with a, a cafe for, uh, for Sire, uh, which is, you know, a really small, uh, almost, you know, a really small uh, area for students to hang out and also for, um, you know, for basically coffee and, you know, simple conditions to be accessible. Let me just see if I can. Okay. Right, so I'm just going to go this way. Um, so, the project is actually an addition of an exist, you know, within an existing building. The building is actually a quarter of a mile long, this uh, old concrete depot. And we were only working within a, you know, small bay, uh, which you'll see in a second when it appears. This showcases a little bit of the process of it, although, as usually, these things are never so linear, so we tend to orchestrate it like that, but you don't really have to buy this whole uh, sequence. But the idea of this project is definitely working in a kind of interstitial way, which is something we are very interested in, meaning uh, given certain conditions, we try to be uh, almost like radically specific in terms of uh, taking advantage of what already existed on the, on the site, which is a huge skylight on, this, you know, on the top of this, uh, of this building, and trying to actually filter light. Basically, the whole project is about complicating the entry of light into the school. Of course, the project doesn't have a huge uh, you know, functional con uh, need the cafe could have existed anyway, but the idea was to try to uh, give it a kind of location by intervening within it. Uh, probably not in an installation kind of way, but in a way that you would have to almost, you know, uh, look at architecture as being, you know, a kind of in, in almost in an interiority. Um, so as you see, this is actually flying through the outside. There's two levels within this sort of, you know, long shell. 
and we actually work with these you know, manifold surfaces that basically produce the effect of almost sucking the light from the existing skyline and diffusing it and deviating it in a way that, of course, light wouldn't really want to do. So there's a certain plasticity to the dynamics of light that goes beyond the light and it engenders movement, it engenders tactility, and hopefully engenders ergonomics when uh, part of this you know, branching uh, manifold goes down and produce the only seating arrangement on the top. Uh, there's two levels to this arrangement. One is the top level, which is you know, mainly a student lounge, and the lower level, which is actually where the kind of function and conditions of the cafe take place. Um, the whole arrangement of the project obeys to A, you know, extending the interest in manifold surfaces using mostly fiberglass and customized plastic making conditions through molds. Um, but also trying to actually um, deliberately trying to integrate those systems and the, cust you know, the custom conditions of those systems which much more uh, probably mundane and, and, and conventional conditions of construction such as drywall and so on. And also to try to integrate sort of more complex formal conditions uh, with conditions that are actually you know, far more localized uh, that have to do with the that had to do with the, ex, you know, the existing site and so on. So as you see, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is the existing shell of the building. There's two levels. This is already existing. And the strategy is to actually like, cover this and cover the whole thing while you know, like sucking the light from, from here. But also actually opening. So this is actually the lower level of the cafe. And it had to be closed, uh, bringing light from the, the east-facing windows in, in this way. So the idea, by, by using light as almost a material, we actually tried to produce something that was a, a kind of, you know, seen as uh, um, a sort of external to the system, of course, but it actually aimed to integration to, you know, the existing beams and the existing sort of columnar structure of that. Uh, also by, you know, trying to be quite specific as the way this thing, you know, begin to uh, uh, intertwine and, and interface with those, you know, pieces of, you know, beams and, and, and the specificity of the, of the skylight in terms of dimensional and, and conditions and so on. So this is the lower level where you get light shining down the surface on the backwards. So ideally, all these conditions will actually induce people to move and you know, buy coffee and wait over there or then actually you know, come up. So this is the lower level plan uh, by which you know, a certain simple arrangement of the cafe in a linear way begins to intertwine uh, with uh, the sort of back part of it that goes up, up you know, and then you get to see this uh, these funnels and uh, branching systems that actually, you know, one, some of them stays all the way on the upper level, though you, know, you almost can get to touch them. And that's the idea of almost, you know, creating a kind of a proximity between the, body, the architectural body and, and the human body at that level. And the sort of coloration of that uh, implied, we actually tried to produce almost another level of articulation uh, beyond the sort of formal one that had to do with the color by means equating almost the entry of light by uh, attempting to paint this in a kind of gradient way by which the sort of softer area would be the one that are normally receives the natural light and then at night this thing would also uh, bear artificial light as well. Unfortunately this project got on hold because of um, it's not clear whether we are actually staying on the building or not but there's you know um, a great deal of study in terms of how all these pieces which are uh, fiberglass in the case of the funnels and more linear components and plastic when it comes to the aggregation of uh, all these pieces which are uh, modular in some cases and unique in some other cases so there is a certain economy to it and the way they actually you know connect together to the existing structure uh, by looking at both conditions which are actually unique but also conditions of uh, assembly which are mechanical so it allows a certain um, standardization of the, of the uh, of the proposition for assembly and so on. Um, ideas of how to embed materials within, you know, what is actually fiberglass and, you know, all the drawings that actually explain the whole, um, you know, sequence. Uh, this is another project that looks at um, probably sort of linear conditions of manifolds. In this case, they're actually almost just tubes. And it was a simple, almost like a conceptual exercise. It was a competition for a vertical garden, uh, mainly a kind of, uh, sort of Archiprop project that Peter Nover, uh, who is the curator of the MAC, 
uh, commend uh, to a few young architects to actually, um, I'm sorry, to produce, uh, to produce a project that will contain and protect the Schindler House um, in, in West Hollywood, which is this piece here, uh, which is a famous building and of course where the Max Center in LA you know, stays to protect this from you know, real estate uh, development that was going on outside, uh, adjacent to the site. Uh, of course, there was a certain oxymoron on that, but it was an interesting condition to, you know, uh, to, to produce a project for that. Uh, the project was to be located on this line almost, uh, on the western um, part of the site. And we tried to, our interest in landscape you know, kind of led us to you know, try to produce something that we don't know whether it would work or not, but it was actually interestingly and playful to, you know, to think about, which was this hydroponic garden, meaning using hydroponic technology, try to actually produce a garden that will be uh, sort of tree-like condition that will definitely grow. So the sort of branching and manifold condition wouldn't be only a formal condition, but it will you know, channel uh, almost you know, water with nutrients that will uh, at some point uh, begin to grow you know, throughout this structure. Uh, They have another movie. Um, so the project is called Fake Plastic Trees, and it's just a kind of irony of uh, basically of a, you know, a favorite song from my favorite band, but it's actually playing with the condition of um, of this, the plasticity of these pieces that we thought it would be like some sort of PVC condition and the fact that you know, they were sort of fake tree-like conditions. They were not intended to imitate nature, they were actually intended to you know, produce almost a kind of alternative of it by looking at a, a quite rational uh, barrier, uh, but also by looking at a barrier that by not having a kind of, um, a sort of agency in terms of producing limitations, would act more as a kind of, uh, as a sort of, um, uh, as a wedge between these two properties and hopefully not to try to masquerade anything but try to actually produce a new life of its own. So that piece that you saw is actually, a, you know, one of the small uh, trees that then proliferates throughout the, uh, the entire structure. Um, this thing looks like it's actually been scripted but it's been in fact sort of modeled. Uh, throughout, so there's some scripting in it which is more manual that has to do with um, you know, producing the same effect over and over and there is a certain regularity in it as you'll see in the, in, the, in the frontal views but yet each of the pieces then as it adapts to the, uh, to the side begins to be slightly different. And the idea was to try to produce a sort of modular condition in both ways, you know, in a way that it would actually be longitudinal to the side but also in the kind of, uh, in, in the sort of uh, Y direction. So you will have these areas that uh, they could be somewhat colonized as people will begin to um, interchange and exchange with it. Um, so this is the frontal view of it. Each of the modules is the same, yet when you actually begin to see it in plan, there's beginning to be variations or adaptability as it deals with the porosity of the, existing, uh, of the existing house. Of course, the whole idea was related to a kind of new kind of uh, relation between architecture and nature that Schindler uh, project epitomized, and we wanted to sort of play along with that by being somewhat respectful of the house, but somewhat unrespectful of the whole um, idea of the competition by engaging both properties and trying to produce more of a, of a relation than a real limit. Uh, so this is one of the pieces by which you actually see sort of change of direction and the braided condition, uh, an area of the wall in which you begin uh, the sort of extension of this, um, of these manifolds begin to produce, you know, almost like a scale of furniture. And the suggestion that this thing was not just fostering a particular kind of life, meaning just human life or interaction, but almost, you know, a kind of ecology that will, you know, contain other forms of life, you know, and other kinds of interaction that will uh, imply a kind of challenge and implying a kind of uh, uh, colonization needed to deal with it. Um, so this is a project that I showed last time and I'm going to move pretty quickly. When I showed last time it was actually a, a, a boutique store for um, hopefully a kind of a sort of um, 
um, you know, interesting and um, high-end brand. Now, actually, it's going to be an art gallery. So this is the kind of things that, you know, it's actually not so material of architecture that I, you know, I'm interested in. And it's, uh, and it's actually has a lot to do with the way we practice, meaning by looking at program, but not extensively defining everything through program, by trying to define rather a set of performances that will ultimately adapt through a number of conditions. So when we started this project, this is actually a, um, it was only a commission of you know, dealing with the envelope and mostly a kind of facade uh, problem uh, of what was going to be a store. And we tried to define a kind of almost our own performance because there wasn't a real clear performance uh, of looking at you know, several lives of this. You know, life that implied performance but also implied certain materiality. One of them was, of course, looking at the possibility of a store, but the other one was looking at the possibility of this having a kind of exhibition life to its own. Uh, one of them had to do with the possibility of you know, reflection and having a kind of opaque condition through the facade, and also had to do with a kind of uh, you know, life of the site, which is you know, Sunset Strip in the middle of West Hollywood, uh, having the life at night, having a kind of glowing condition, having a sort of uh, glamour that is actually necessary at that, at that, in that part of town, which we had to engage, uh, obviously not through images, which 99% you know, of the projects do, but rather through architecture and rather through physicality and, and form and space. Uh, there was another kind of performance we had to do with the body, independently of what this was. We wanted to draw attention to this piece by drawing attention to the space. So the performance of the surfaces that will produce the, the envelope would actually you know, make these conditions. You know, either create a kind of large opening by creating this sort of huge torsional part of the, of the store and drawing people in, or create this almost voyeuristic condition by the gills by producing this kind of uh, almost like oblique relation between interior and exterior. So openings and surfaces are all related to the same uh, kind of geometry that then fall inwards and at that time produce a stair piece, which actually is not happening right now. So the whole project is actually you know, modeled with ruled surfaces. Hopefully, in our intention to you know, deal with the constraints of you know, material that could be actually bended, so you don't have to mold everything. So you're looking at sheets of material that are actually cut, and then there's a relationship between the final product in terms of what you're doing. A series of prototypes were done, and then, of course, you know, the mutation of that. And we were able to customize the material as well. You know, we wanted this to look like metal, uh, but also you know, to have a kind of life of plasticity as well. So, the different pigmentations of the plastic and then the different reflections of it and translucency given certain backlight condition. Um, you know, volume system in order to take all these pieces and be able to uh, form them together so they maintain a certain cohesion and then this thing performs as an envelope. And panelization strategies by which you, know, you try to not let the partition of the hole to actually get in your way in terms of the understanding of it. And this search has some few images of the way this thing is looking now. Um, hopefully this time I can say it will be finished soon. And now it's actually an art gallery, which is you know, probably a more interesting function for this, which is not a uh, uh, so program-driven piece. Uh, the view of the inside of this piece is where you begin to see that the material, though performing like a, almost like a surface of the car, uh, not being seamless, but actually looking at the way in which uh, seam conditions could be uh, reduced to a minimum so they don't become actually uh, detrimental to the whole project. Yet, you don't actually try to engender something which, is, uh, which reads as monolithic, but rather looks as something that you know, definitely reads as a symbol. Um, you know, the life of it within the site, and you know, some of the images as this thing goes along. Uh, changing of material as you actually go towards the entry. Um, you know, some of the last views of it. And the scale of it, which is actually rather large, the whole thing is like 60 feet by 30 feet, so it looks smaller in the images, but it's actually a rather large piece. Um, this is another one of those projects that hasn't been finished, and it's even older. It's a house in Rosario, Argentina, where we happen to have two projects actually under construction. This is almost finished now. And it's an interesting project because it deals with almost a kind of progression of work and, and a progression of the, our own hypothesis of what you know, producing a whole and producing architecture is. In this case, uh, it's a single family house, uh, 200 square meters, um, three bedroom organization that 
It's actually on the outskirts of Rosario in a very flat landscape. There's almost like no context outside rather than only a few houses and you know, basically flat land of the Pampas outside there. So this is where we were looking at the pattern and actually I, I uh, studied with Jesse Reiser and he was definitely a big influence in our work. So there's a lot of early work that definitely has geometry embedded into it. And of course, all the works have geometry, I'm sorry. But many of them, you know, at this point intended to actually uh, extrapolate that geometry into a particular kind of almost a structural matrix. Although it was never the intention to do it like that. This was more like to try to show how all the operations that will take place on the house will definitely be derived from a particular kind of almost geometric subset, you know, geometric matrix that control the whole fenestration and the structuring of it. So as you see, Holes are actually not uh, arbitrary conditions, but actually conditions on opportunities to try to cut the mass in a very opportunistic way by always evidencing a, a certain dynamism and then by producing relief or producing edge or lips, as we call it, that will uh, ultimately kind of evidence a certain continuity or discontinuity within the mass. Of course, I'm describing this in a purely formal terms. There's certainly, you know, uh, um, activity within this, you know, that had to do with a certain social constructions of adjacency. You know, one of the intentions was not to produce a kind of uh, almost sort of transparent continuity between inside and outside the sort of Messian condition of, you know, just contemplating the landscape, which has certainly a lot out, you know, around it, but rather produce sort of more oblique moments and produce more physical continuity between certain social uh, spaces, mainly between uh, the sort of social area of the living and uh, dining, the pool and uh, almost like a green, ga a green garden um, flower forcing facility that the, one of the owners wanted to have there. And so there's like, you know, this almost two moments of torsion and torquing where the projects tend to mutate and always engaging in some form of nature or control nature. Either it's in a small uh, light well inside uh, or the actually, you know, the sort of flatness of the landscape on the outside. Um, so the relation to the pool, and this is actually the only part that is actually missing. And this is the relation, you know, the site, as you see, there's, you know, kind of not much going on. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I have no explanation for this, but this is kind of the <laughs> context uh, there, and I thought it was funny, so. But the house is, you know, sitting there, and it's almost finished now. These are actually not quite the recent pictures. As you see, the effects of fenestration, the pool is missing, which is actually an important part in order to complete this, uh, this hole. And, you know, the relations of how the openings that are always, you know, breaching more than one room, more than one, um, you know, space inside. So they're always creating this almost interstitial spaces that, you know, force you to move and to look around and to relate to other places of the house. And of course, this you know was done in conjunction with the, our clients that were of course you know pretty happy about living in it, and now they're actually moving to Caracas. So it's uh, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but you know then the sort of modulation of the continuum by which let's say you're not just trying to sculpt the form, but also you're trying to then find out the means by which um, you know these conditions of torsion are not just formal effects, but they're also spatial effects by which you know, you're forced to look at the landscape in different ways and understand you know, verticality or horizontality, up and down or you know, left or right. Um, you know, there's a lot of technical problems. This is Argentina and you know, it's not Los Angeles, so it rains a lot. So um, you know, we call it a bucket house because there's actually a few buckets that needs to be in place when it rains. Uh, so you know, we don't. Uh, end up with other issues. Uh, the whole thing is concrete, and we try to look at concrete in, you know, in, at that moment, in, the, in as monolithic way as possible, by almost erasing any seam. This is something maybe I would change today, and this is something we are trying to maybe, you know, review in our work in terms of means of articulation that are not necessarily trying to erase materiality at certain level, uh, but look at other possibilities. So in this particular case, the other moment of the house, you know, the entry, sequence where you know the surface actually torsions up and then you know deals with a kind of a long series of apertures that are you know in some cases series of cuts that produce depth and other cases just you know simple extrusions in to produce uh, windows um, 
quickly a project in China, in Chengdu. We were asked to uh, work on a kind of a hybrid office uh, building in uh, central China, actually very close to where the epicenter of the earthquake was. And so this project, it's kind of on hold right now, but the, the project was actually part of a, a big campus that contained you know, a series of other projects like this. So we were given a kind of parcel, but the parcels really did not exist. So we had to work almost in a kind of generic way. And so we established a conceptual framework by which uh, the landscape of the golf course, which will be one side of the project, and the interiority of you know, a Chinese courtyard will begin to play almost in a kind of uh, mediated way. And in that way, you know, holes or organizational systems such as you know, light wells or course begin to be important in terms of how to, how to structure space. This is actually early conceptual models or early um, you know, diagrams that we use in order to try to quickly relate to what the, our clients uh, wanted. Uh, that's actually our project there, <laughs> but this, you know, uh, we figured that there was like, I mean, we realized at that point that there were like so many other projects that were you know, somewhat similar in terms of footprint and so on, although they had chosen ours to be the first one because of the, you know, the form or the inherent formalism they saw in our case. But um, we tried to work in this way um, just so we could deal with almost a sort of generic volume. And so not to actually depart from a box, but depart from a kind of lineage that will then you know, infiltrate uh, a kind of given primitive with more local operations that will be more sort of inward, you know, trying to produce a kind of inner life by looking at both you know, a kind of condition of, uh, of an inner courtyard that will function as a kind of social space, uh, but also conditions of fluctuation towards the edges. So the project has a kind of uh, relation to the landscape. This is a you know, whole manicure construction because the landscape doesn't quite exist and the site is actually mutating. And a series of plans in which you show the relation between movement and the organization of this inner courtyard and almost a kind of relation of passage between the inside of the project. Um, almost something that I always like about the Carpenter Center in which you know, a project has something where you enter and then if you are not really careful, you're always already going out. And so there is a level of reversibility in the project that takes place by form, geometry, space, and the maneuvering of architectural system. So this takes place somewhere in, this, in the space. And, and the reason for that was because the project did not have a quiet site. We wanted to engender something quite specifically in the interiority of it that would always work no matter where it would be placed. And it would already create a certain tension which was you know, diagonally in the site, but then it would begin to eat out or begin to affect the whole you know, gridded structure of the project as you actually see it on the plan. Two frontal and back elevations produced in a similar condition, almost also because of the, uh, having a certain economy of means by which you know, things would always be repeated if they actually happen to be built. Uh, a set of fenestration that actually moved beyond you know, conventional windows uh, through producing a kind of like waffle slab that will A, collaborate with the structural cantilever condition, but also produce you know, uh, probably conditions of illumination at night. And you know, the relation of this sort of torquing space from the outside that will lead to the whole uh, development of the courtyard, the evolution of the section, and the view of the courtyard on the inside. Uh, this is actually you know, much deeper than that. Um, and you know, more uh, traditional slab system. The view from the, in the entry uh, diagonally going across through the project uh, relation to the pool in the looking at the golf course and then the view of the other side of the fenestration which is all this modulation that takes place on the ceiling. Um, very quickly another uh, it's a housing scheme for Los Angeles and this is another project by which you know the hall in this case is actually made out of sort of incremental uh, units by looking at you know a very simple sequencing of change and gradation we try to deal with a very complex condition, which is the, the, the need for densification in Los Angeles and the need to do it in a sort of a serious way by which not implanting you know, white elephants, as they call it, uh, which tend to you know, populate. So there is a kind of extremity you know, inherent in the duality that you know, nothing happens or if something happens, it's actually really bad. So we were asked to contribute a proposal that you know, finally did not get through. Uh, because of the neighborhood commission, but it was actually an interesting way by which to apply 
uh, you know, formal techniques or applied diagrams in trying to produce uh, you know, architectural form that could you know, hopefully breach that uh, spatial condition. Dealing with a neighborhood that is only you know, made out of houses that are actually only ground level and trying to produce you know, up to four levels of, uh, of uh, uh, four stories was actually one of the techniques we wanted to produce. And also trying to come up with an economy of means that would allow certain uh, of our interests to be implanted in a you know, very restricted economy of uh, real estate development. So this is the whole process by which you know, the volume is created and then a set of subtraction you know, are produced so as adjacency and, and boundaries of the whole organization are always kept at one level. So the whole organization has actually a dual gradient. One is sort of a gradient massing that begins to grow as it goes to the center of the site, hopefully distorting as less as possible the kind of peace around in the neighborhood. And the other one had to do with the kind of gradual condition of you know, um, privacy and publicity in between the blocks themselves to try to produce something that is a whole but also has enough partition so it has enough of identity as individual pieces uh, for their own inhabitants. So the massing condition, the certain modularity of it, and a certain local um, changes which are also based on, on similar uh, shift of geometry. So that means that all the pieces that are produced, especially all the, you know, the root surfaces, are always uh, modular. I mean, and that had to do with a, an idea of constructibility that we actually had to come up and a kind of gradient that will imply either the appearance of color or also the appearance of a kind of, uh, you know, almost a kind of a ambiguity in relationship between inside and outside, um, privacy and, and publicity as well. And double height space, you know, develop out of that. So anyway, quickly, the last project. Um, the first project I did when I finished graduate school was this. Uh, it was in 1998, we had the opportunity to build it. And it's actually an eight, 10 to 10 story housing building in Rosario, Argentina. And now actually almost like, you know, more than 10 years after that, we're actually doing another project uh, like this, two blocks actually from this uh, project, which we call uh, Jujuy Redux, because it's actually on the same street, uh, two blocks maybe probably towards a fancier neighborhood, but that doesn't matter as much as the fact that it is actually a corner building. Uh, the limitations were you know, rather similar, which is um, you know, very sort of conventional possibilities for massing and definitely trying to operate on the envelope in a way that definitely does not uh, happen that much uh, over there or you know, somewhat anywhere in terms of you know, alternating open and closed spaces. Uh, looking at fenestration, uh, basically dealing with both the possibility of an open balcony, which is something that is desired and is definitely sick for in terms of the project, but also dealing with more conventional openings. And in more in important, you know, we wanted to produce a kind of poche. We wanted to produce a sort of extension of the of the of the volume into surface that will create a kind of almost a sort of conflict that would allow for depth, would allow for fenestration to happen in a more complex way. Uh, so this is the elevation of the project. This um, eight to 10 story project, there are 14 apartments, really small apartments, and it's a corner building. This is the view of that. There's actually two apartments per floor, plus a small duplex on the top. And the idea is actually to, you know, to play between a kind of volume condition to surface producing those moments in between, which is, you know, these moments of what I call almost poche, which happen in a very, very small region of the, of the project, but it begins to produce a kind of almost an intermediate space that hopefully begin to deal with ergonomics and so on. This is actually not quite finished as a project, so we're actually working the design as we go, but the sequence of the, of the sections as this thing evolves, uh, it's actually almost like that and it produces these kind of effects by which you go from a conventional strip window to these openings by A, producing a certain privacy in the balcony and, and giving a kind of, you know, a certain almost orientation to the balcony by not just extending the slab, but rather looking at producing a kind of plasticity within that. Something, you know, quite classic in terms of, you know, other buildings, uh, but definitely not seen that much in the context of, of, this, uh, of this project. And obviously trying to produce then, you know, a certain set of effects of illumination, you know, when it came to uh, at night. Of course, this is in 
uh, under construction. Of course, there is a mass to it and there is a core. The system is actually concrete, a core with the stair and then you know, a series of you know, peripheral columns with a big cantilever and columnar transition right on the corner that you will see. Uh, it develops out of here for the need of trying to um, basically position this amount of space inside that. And the view from the corner of that. And then the kind of construction system by which the repetition of this piece will be, you know, basically able to be constructed in ways that, you know, had certain reality, material reality and economy to it. And this is actually a rule surface, and these are actually a series of rule surfaces that repeat. So there are actually two kinds, and they repeat in each side, uh, producing almost this kind of a, uh, oblique diagonal condition in each facade. And the mold for that, by which we use fiberglass uh, to try to produce something that will, you know, stay the same. And you know, we try the wooden part first, and this is actually just a model, but because of certain limitations, it wouldn't work. So this is the way the, the, the whole formwork was made. And these are just some construction images. Uh, of course, this is not nearly as perfect as the concrete you guys have here or the concrete you will see in Japan, but it's actually a kind of concrete that, you know, it's definitely a very giving material that acquires these kind of conditions of, you know, plasticity and, you know, the modulation of it and, you know, the way it goes up. And it's pretty rough so far, but it's actually uh, will be finished probably at the end of next year. The inner part of the stair, some of other pieces of these balconies, and they're actually a kind of facing of construction that probably does not allow you to see much of the way it's going to be made. And holes. Uh, I thought I began with holes, and I will, you know, kind of end with holes. Uh, so they're somewhat everywhere. These are modular holes that actually serve as a filtering device between the, the kitchen of some apartments as it actually goes to the more public spaces. The big um, transition, actually a huge uh, structural change there. Uh, not very happy the client, and, uh, but we are actually quite happy. And, uh, so more holes as they actually ready to get casting and geometry or line work and the effects of it in materiality and material. Thank you.